afternoon, everybody. I'm Andrew Smith Herman, class of 2006. I'm also a member of the uh, the Black Alumni Alliance. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, we have a fantastic opportunity to hear from some of Sidwell's first Black alumni. Uh, so really, without further ado, I'd like to start with, uh, with George Cohen. Uh, and if you could tell us your name and cat class year, the year you entered Sidwell Friends and how long you were at Sidwell, uh, where your occupation or your career took you over time and where you currently live. Okay, I'm George Cohen. I was at Sidwell from 65 to 69. And uh, currently I'm a physician uh, dermatologist by trade. And uh, I'm just glad to be here. I have a short story vignette I'd like to share with people at the correct time. I look forward to hearing to it. Uh, Dorothy, Dorothy Davis, could you uh, also tell us your name and class year, time at Sidwell Friends, occupation, career, and where you currently live? Oh, looks like we might have lost Dorothy. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll wait for her to come on back. And uh, George Ferguson, if you could do the same thing, please. And you're muted, George. I'm George Ferguson. I was at Sidwell from 1964 through 1967. I, um, after graduating, I worked for 30 years at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development as a career civil servant until I retired in 2000. Um, my last job was as deputy director of the Federal Council on Homelessness that coordinated all federal programs for homeless assistance. And I currently live in Bloomington, Minnesota. Fantastic. Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Certainly, I'm Cheryl Howard, was Dottie back then. Um, cannot believe it's been so long. I entered in 1964. I graduated in 1967. And um, I'm in Boston now where I went for college and have remained here. Um, I'm currently retired, having um, about 40 year career in uh, new product marketing at the Gillette Company for many years, at Digital Equipment Company, which believe it or not was the number two computer company in the world in its day, it's gone. And um, finally a decade at Simmons University where I was in administration. Nice to hear from you. I'm looking forward to hearing from you a little bit more as we go on. Um, Gregory Jackson, if you could. Hi, I'm Gregory Jackson, class of 69. I came into Sidwell in 1966. Um, after graduating, I, I went to Rutgers, uh, graduated undergrad, worked there for a few years, uh, went back to law school there, returned to, to DC in 78. And um, I'm a retired senior judge here at DC Superior Court. I'm still still living in DC. All right. Last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Mazik, please introduce yourself. Dr. Mazik, um, the first one, first one, first African American student at Sidwell Friends. This is true. 1957, <laughs> 1962. Um, been a physician for 42 years, and basically. Um, tell your children not to follow my career path. I just go where the need is most needed. I've been on six reservations. This is my sixth reservation, VA, Walter Reed for 10 years, nine professorships. And uh, I got to keep on medicine because I don't know what else to do. So here I am. <laughs> well, certainly, and uh, as everybody can hear, certainly, again, quite an opportunity to hear from everybody. So I'd like to start with, uh, with the questions. Uh, with you, George Ferguson, uh, what made you decide to come to Sidwell Friends? And was there somebody or something that made you really consider Sidwell Friends and made that your strongest choice? Um, I was in the first class at um, Sidwell that had more than one student. Jeffrey was before us. But in 1964, a group around 1964, a group of parents at Sidwell decided, um, noticed that um, despite all the civil rights activity and so forth, they were sending their kids to segregated schools. So they funded a scholarship fund called then the Negro Student Fund and later became the Black Student Fund to sponsor African-American students from 
DC public schools mainly to go to um, private schools in the area. And I was one of um, five or six that first year in 1967 to take advantage of those scholarships. Um, and basically I, it was an offer that I couldn't refuse. I was um, called down to the principal's office one day in my junior high school in DC and men mentioned that I had this opportunity and was I interested in pursuing it? And I chose to, so that's how I ended up at Friends. Certainly, and I think for this question, I'm going to go from, from year to year. I see Cheryl's already got a 67 next to her name, so I'd like to follow up with you, Cheryl. What was your experience like in choosing to come to Sidwell Friends? Well, uh, George sort of captured it. Um, I was uh, at Jefferson Junior High School, and the principal you know, asked if I would be interested. Uh, they were looking for African-American students to enter Sidwell Friends. As it turned out, George, Lonnie, and Clifton Barber. So there were five of us. Four of us already knew each other from the DC public schools. We had been together at um, Bacchus. And so it was just as George said, it was an incredible opportunity. Um, I remember the discussion with my mother asking if you know, we would be integrating um, so, you know, what would, the, what would be the impact of that? Um, but from my point of view, it was a great opportunity. The entire um, cost was being paid, being uh, paid for. Uh, mine was actually paid for by the Florida Avenue Friends Meeting, and they were part of the supporting group for the, as it was called, the Negro uh, Student Fund, now the Black Student Fund. So it was just a wonderful opportunity. and. Uh, could not say no. I will say that you know I was a lifer at Sidwell Friends, and so I don't I don't think I ever had a conversation with my mother about whether or not I was going to go at the age of four. But uh, that's and that's because of all of you, which is which is fantastic. Uh, Gregory Jackson, if you could also let me know if there's somebody you know your decision and somebody or something that influenced you greatly to come along to Sidwell. Well, in, in many ways, my experience was like that of George and Cheryl, except I, I don't recall that I was called to the principal's office. I think I went <laughs> to, the, to the counselor's office, but um, I was told about this opportunity. I was at Gordon Junior High School, and I was told about this opportunity to, to go to Sidwell. And I didn't know anything about Sidwell other than where it was located, because uh, a lot of times I would take the bus uh, across town to Friendship Heights and then down Wisconsin Avenue to Gordon Junior High School, which was on first Wisconsin Avenue. And so I would pass the school, but didn't know much about it. And um, at first, after taking the test, I wasn't admitted. And I, I wasn't all that disappointed because I was interested in going to either DeMath or John Carroll because I was playing <laughs> basketball. Um, but um, this, this, the junior high schools, um, the principal and the counselor from um, Gordon, I'm told, intervene and, um, I was called back to Sidwell for a second interview. And after the second interview, I was admitted. And so I decided to, to go to Sidwell instead of DeMath or John Carroll. And it was, a, it was the right decision. The minute you said DeMath or John Carroll, I had an inkling as to where your choice might have been leading you and why you were about to make that choice. But I'm glad you came to Sidwell. Uh, George Cohen. I have no idea how I ended up at Sidwell. <laughs> uh, I've never heard of it. One day, my mother said, Georgie, you like to go to a school where they ride horses? I say, Mom, that sounds like a white school. Is it all white? <laughs> she said, no, it's one quarter black. And the only time it was one quarter is if it was me and three white guys in the bathroom. <laughs> but it was uh, serendipitous, and it turned out to be a marvelous education, and I'm better for having gone there. Absolutely. We're better for having you. Uh, Jeff? I have some long stories to tell you. Okay. Basically, when my son was at Sidwell, and he was maybe about 12 or 13, um, we were in one of the rooms there, and I pulled out the book, The History of Sidwell. And it talked about integration in Sidwell, and my name was not in that book. And so my son says, uh, Dad, I thought you said that you were the first African-American Sidwell. I'm like, uh, so I had to spend a couple months and so the thing, which is, uh, I guess the most painful thing about that is that basically I had been written out of history and more importantly, my mother had been written out of history. Now, what had happened is that integration came in 1954. 
she realized that any school that you would go to as an African-American, they would probably get the inferior teachers and it was integrated, but you would get the inferior, right? Uh, she applied for my brother to get to sit well, but what they did, they didn't let him in on a the technicality. They said that we'd only let a Negro in if they started in kindergarten and he would have been in first grade, right? So they didn't let him in, but uh, they let me in. And so the question is, is that how many Afro-Americans like my mother who fought this, you know, and you know about a senator who took his kids out. As soon as I got in, the senator of Mississippi took his kids out. I don't know if you know that story. Okay. I do. <laughs> and so how many Afro-Americans have been written out of history? And I don't know why I got written out, but um, it got reversed. So that's fine. So there we go. That, that is a story I've heard before. And it, it's a nice, uh, not nice, but it's a good dovetail into uh, my next question, which is about your experience, you know, so maybe if the experiences aren't all part of history, you know, if there's, if there's an experience early in your time at Civil Friends that, was particularly important or helped to shape you over time. And I'd like to start with you, Cheryl, um, and, and start with your experience. Thank you. Um, that's a really good question. And thank you for sharing it in advance because I did spend some time really thinking about it and looking back. So obviously people can count, we're talking 54 years ago that I entered. And so I wanted to see what is what do I think now? What did I think 20 years ago? Um, and it was a very good experience for me. So the experience that I had that has really shaped me is threefold. First, that entering Sidwell Friends, I was academically prepared. The DC public school that I attended and had attended, which was Jefferson Backus and um, um, Taft had prepared me. So I entered prepared. I could do the academic work. And in time, I did graduate with honors. So that was the first thing, I'm prepared. The second was I deserve to be there because I'm prepared and because I can contribute, I deserve to be there. And then finally, I was warmly welcomed. So what I've taken through my career is wherever I've gone, I, I'm prepared. So when I applied to Harvard Business School, which at that time back in the 70s, only 5% of the people admitted were African-American or women. So of course I counted twice, um, but I took the idea that I'm prepared. I then took, I deserve to be there in that classroom and I'm going to assume that I'm going to be welcomed warmly. And for the most part, I was. And when I went into my career, when I had assignments working in, for example, Germany, which I did for Gillette, or in London, places that as a Black girl, I mean, I never thought about going to those places. You know, I always approach, I'm prepared, I deserve to be here and I'm gonna assume that they're gonna welcome me warmly. So it's a lesson that I've taken and I, I do really find that it has been very helpful from that experience. I, I really do appreciate that. I, I feel the same way and it, you know, it's something that I don't necessarily think about as, as actively as you had to. And that's again, because of those of us on this, uh, those of you, I should say, on this call. Um, Greg, I don't mean to put you on the spot here. Did you feel prepared? I, I did feel prepared for the most part. I, I had good teachers in the DC public school system. I went to Emory Elementary School, Langley Junior High School for a year, and then was transferred to Gordon Junior High School when they decided, the city decided that the, the schools west of Rock Creek Park were essentially segregated. And this was a way to desegregate um, those schools because I still lived in Northeast uh, over by McKinley Tech. And so I, I traveled all the way across the city to go to, to Gordon Junior High School. And then um, while I was at Sidwell, my family moved up to the Tacoma Park section of DC. So I was in the zone for Coolidge, but I was still, I was still at Sidwell. And so I, I did actually feel prepared. It was a little bit of an adjustment academically, but um, that did, didn't take long. The, there were several things about being a Sidwell that was helpful. One, I felt really supported by 
Cheryl, Lonnie, David Simmons, George, and others who were in the class ahead of me. And so even though our numbers were small, we were actually a, a very supportive and, and close-knit group. And so th that helped a lot. There was always somebody there to sort of keep you on the right path. And I, I, I got a daily briefing because I, I rode back and forth to school every day with Lonnie Simmons, uh, Lonnie Edmonds and David Simmons. And so if there was any question about what I needed to be concerned about or what I should do, <laughs> that got answered in the drive uh, to school in the morning, even though we were always late. Because uh, <laughs> Lonnie was always late. <laughs> so that was, th that was very significant for me. The other thing was that um, we encountered some, some racism, but I didn't, not, I didn't really feel it at Sidwell. I felt, felt it at the other schools that we competed with. Um, and and I, I felt that the school did okay in, in supporting us. Um, when we played against St. Stephen's, for example, in, in basketball, um, that was a very unwelcoming environment when we had to go there to play. Um, they would play Dixie uh, and, and do it on purpose. And so um, I, I, I thought that the school made us feel as comfortable as they kind of knew how at the time. Um, and, and, and that was very helpful. Well, first, I got to hear maybe after this call, I got to hear more about this club that you and Cheryl were in. I want to know if you're still extending some invitations or, you know, I might like one, but uh um, but also, I can't even imagine what it would be like to to hear Dixie as you're lining up, and you know, I, I can't even imagine. You 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 deal with it. It was it was the sign of the times, and the thing was to try to go out and beat them. That was that was the answer to the, their playing Dixie. I like that. Was the, I like the, that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, George Ferguson, can you talk to me about your experience? And uh, was there something particularly important, or something that shapes you even again now to this day? Yeah, it's not necessarily a single experience, but as, as Cheryl mentioned, um, I felt prepared. I went to elementary school in Anacostia and junior high school in Northeast Washington. And in both cases, because of the demographics of the area, at least half of my classmates in those were white. So the transition to Sidwell was not as great as it could have been um, for others. I think all of us at the beginning felt incredible support from both this, whoever was giving us the funding, our parents, friends, churches, and, and the teachers and other students. I recall um, we were lucky in that we attended in 1960, when we attended in 1964, the upper school building was brand new. So we shared that experience with all the upperclassmen at the time as we ended, we ended as sophomores. And in addition, they expand because they had more space. I think they expanded the class a little bit. So the time we were coming in, there weren't just lifers. There were some brand new people, um, Caucasians, who were joining at the same time we were. So we, we had a lot in common to begin with. Um, just before school began, our first year in 1964, I recall a class party that one of the parents sponsored and everybody in the class was invited. And they gave us rides because we came from way across town. The party was with Bethesda, so we didn't have a ride. And they assigned um, people to offer us rides. And the person who gave me a ride was, this, I later learned, the son of the Secretary of Defense. It wasn't even in our class, but he had volunteered to do that. So, I mean, there was that sort of support from everybody there. Failure is not an option. Um, we were sort of told when we started that we were picked very carefully. Um, they wanted us, everybody wanted us to succeed. So we were picked very carefully for background to make the transition as easy as, as, as possible academically so that there wouldn't be any bumps. Um, and I think pretty much it was successful. There was no single experience, but I think that whole, what sticks in my mind is just that feeling of support. If we needed it, it was there. That certainly resonates with me as well. I, I certainly get that feeling from time to time, even now, um, especially now where, you know, failure is not an option. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, Jeff, what about you? So talk to me about your experience and something that may have shaped you. Well, not a lot of experiences because I was so young, but I would say most of the Sidwell experiences that made a big impression on me is through my two sons who both went to Sidwell, right? And so again, in terms of, because I've come back to Sidwell, I, there was a teacher there named Mrs. Wooden who taught science. 
And she would invite me back to her class. I get to talk about medicine when I was working with Walter Reed. And basically what I found in the student population in my, in my son's classes, they were just very charitable, very outgoing. And again, eager to learn because I'm working with a Sidwell student right now who's a senior and he's working on this long involved project of medicine on the res. And we've been working for about six months and uh, I probably have sent him literally a thousand emails and he's very, very, very good guy. And so he wants to help redo the health system, particularly in terms of Native Americans. And I'm learning from him and he's learning from me, hopefully. Okay. Um, George Cohen. Yes, uh, going to Sidwell was very interesting because in the 60s, Washington was essentially a de facto segregated city. And I had to shuttle between two worlds, a black world and a white world. Academically, it wasn't a problem because two plus two equals four. I don't care what race you are, what socioeconomic class you come from. And so I liked math and science and two plus two is the same in any frame of reference. So I was able to get through the work without sweating. I only sweated thanks to my good friend, Michael Kaplan, who's on this when I joined the wrestling team. <laughs> and I had to become anorexic for four years. <laughs> but, uh, if I may, I'd like to capitalize my Sidwell experience in the dichotomy by reading a short story, if that's possible. Please do. Okay. From the age 1 to 18, I lived at 932 S Street Northwest in the heart of the Negro checkerboard DC. The east-west streets were named alphabetically and perpendicular to them were the north-south streets, which were named numerically, making this geography of segregated black DC analogous to the squares on a checkerboard. There were several large avenues, e.g. Florida Avenue, that meandered in a nonlinear manner. My house was at the epicenter of Black Paradise. This area of DC offered a respite from the omnipresent racism, discrimination, slights, and humiliation one encountered in greater white DC. No eating hot dogs on the street outside of that department store because only whites could dine in. No purchasing clothes and hoping they would fit because Blacks were not allowed to try on clothing in the fitting rooms to the large department stores downtown. In the checkerboard, you could sit all day long at Ben's Chili Bowl and enjoy a half smoke with chili. And one could try on the latest fly styles at Cavalier's Men's Store on 7th Street. The checkerboard, despite the winos, junkies, and whores, was a black paradise. There was the fabulous U Street, also known as Black Broadway, replete with the ornate Lincoln Republican Tea Theaters, Cab Calloway, the Duke, and innumerable Black entertainers played at the U Street juke joints and the world-famous Howard Theater on T Street. Florida Avenue was one was where one shopped for the finest footwear, Bally's, Footjoys, and other pimped out brands. Cavalier's men's shop was the quintessential player's haberdashery with the latest in purple suits and matching purple hats with large feathers in the hat band. Waxy Maxi sold the latest 45 RPM records for 69 cents. Wings and Things on George Avenue sold indescribably delicious wings with mumbo sauce. Log Cabin Liquors was one of my favorite spots. I just turned 18 and could buy beer by showing my draft card. Soul Food Restaurants, Barbershops, WUST Radio Music Dance Hall, the Bowen YMCA were all treasures and cultural icons. Two miles south of the checkerboard on 7th Street, were the large department stores, Hans, Woody's, Hecht, etc. And one mile north at the apex of a steep hill was Banneker Junior High School and the capstone of Black Education, Howard University. From this hilltop vantage point, one could smell the fragrant goods baking at Wonder Bread Factory. And on a clear day, one could see past Black Paradise all the way to Hex downtown and feel that all was well. Then, the music died. Sidwell Friends was a very prestigious school located on Upper Northwest Avenue Northwest. It was four miles as a crow flies from S Street, but to get there, I had to take two buses. First, an east-west bus to Georgetown, and then a north bus to Sidwell. 
is made to journey closer to six miles. April 1968, mid-afternoon, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and school was dismissed early. There were auras of anxiety, fear, sadness, shock, disbelief, and who knows, maybe some malignant glee in the air. Everyone didn't love Martin and many disapproved of his tactics, agenda, and increasingly radicalized tone. Holding hands, turning the other cheek, and singing We Shall Overcome, despite biting dogs and waterboarding, boarding 1960s style, was widely viewed as noble, humble, and appropriately nonviolent. However, asking to end the Vietnam War was a boy stepping out of his lane, and a, many a good white man asked, what you talking about, Martin? But I digress. My immediate problem was how to get home. No buses were running south on Wisconsin Avenue, and no white classmate in their right mind would drive into a black riot to take me home, and I couldn't blame them. So my choice was simple. I'd have to walk the six miles to S Street. Since Wisconsin Avenue was out, I decided to walk east along Military Road past Rock Creek Park to the corner of Georgia Avenue and Missouri Avenue. Since Georgia Avenue was the main thoroughfare to the black neighborhood, I guessed incorrectly that I could catch a southbound bus and, and ride the remaining three miles to S Street. No bus service. So I walked, on, walked south on Georgia Avenue past the tranquil areas in Petworth. Once I was approximately 1.5 miles south, I could sense an eeriness. No cars, no taxi cabs, no buses, few people. When I reached the apex of the hill near Bannock and Howard University, the fragrant smell from the bread factory was replaced by the acrid stench of burning and scorched material. Instead of the inspiring vista of black paradise in downtown DC, there was a rolling black mushroom cloud punctuated at the base by scattered red flashes of ongoing fires. The descent toward S Street was tantamount to Donate's Inferno each block became more hellish. Georgia Avenue turns into 7th Street at its intersection with Florida Avenue. Once on 7th Street, I saw the riot at its fulsome peak. Fresh fires rage, doors were burnt out, broken glass littered the street like a perverse repetition of crystal knot. Negroes were running through the streets with TVs, furniture, groceries, liquor, anything they could carry. Not one cop was in sight. Brown's corner was looted and all the foot joys and other fine shoes were gone. Cavalier's was looted. No more band lawn shirts. No more Italian knits. No hats with feathers. Virtually every store was looted, burning or burned out, except a few Negro barbershops with Soul Brothers signs in the window. At the corner of 7th and S Street was the charred remnant of my beloved log cabin liquor. I walked through the shattered glass door. It was heart-wrenching to see the shelves empty and broken, soot and char everywhere, and one lone bumper of Coke 45 malt liquor miraculously intact and that looted on the floor. I walked the final two blocks west to 932 S Street and went home. Dad was home. He was a mailman and got off work around 3 p.m. every day. He immediately bellowed, get in the house, boy. You're not going out to that goddamn riot. The next day, school was closed. Armored military vehicles drove down S Street with mounted machine guns on display. Stern looking white officers with fixed bayonets marched in a menacing manner down a residential street. And an official with a bullhorn announced a curfew. You could sit in your yard after 6 p.m., but no one was allowed on the street. After a few days of calm, the curfew was lifted and I took the usual two buses back to school. Yet each day my heart would ache as I yearned for wings with mumbo sauce or a new record from Waxy Maxies. The Howard Theater was gone, Cavaliers was gone. In fact, 7th Street remained a charred, desolate shell for decades until gentrification, spelled white developers, bought up everything and turned the checkerboard into a chrome and glass haven for yuppies and hipsters. My final assessment, I hope the rioters were happy with the TV's chicken and liquors they stole. The price we all paid was Black Paradise Lost. Black Paradise, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. You're welcome.
I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome Dorothy, uh, Dorothy back. Um, Dorothy, if you could uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, let us know your your name, your class year, when you came to Sidwell Friends, when you left, your occupation, and where you live right now. Hello to everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I came Dorothy Davis. Um, the class year is 1971, but I was only at Sidwell from 1964 to 1967, which was sixth to eighth grades. Um, and I am, I have two businesses. One is Dorothy M. Davis Consulting, which focuses on international development consulting and communications rather. And um, the other one is Griffith Day Davis Photographs and Archives, which is a collection of photographs and legacy of my father, um, who was a foreign service officer and a, a photojournalist. Um, I arrived at uh, Sidwell, uh, let me back up. I was born into the foreign service. <laughs> so I was born in Liberia and raised in Tunisia. These are emerging, Tunisia was emerging. They had just become independent. And from Tunisia, I arrived, we arrived in New Jersey uh, when I was about seven years old. Um, my parents, uh, wanted us to go to, go to school in the US. Uh, when we were based in Tunisia, my parents wanted us to go to school in the US in order to uh, get to know our relatives, but also to start getting on a trajectory in terms of college. So anyway, they uh, applied for, there's a back reason why I'm coming to this. There's a, they applied, uh, they contacted a school, a private school in New Jersey from Tunisia and um, everything was worked out so that I could start in the school. Now, my mother came over from Tunisia and asked to meet with the principal. And when the principal realized that she was black, all of a sudden all bets off and I wasn't supposed to go to that school and my parents ultimately sued the school and won and opened private schools to black students and therefore people of color for the state of New Jersey. That is the background to me coming to Sidwell. Um, now we lived in New Jersey till 1964, June 1964 and moved to DC because my dad was uh, working at the mothership state department um, and he picked Sidwell. That's all I can tell you. I knew nothing about Sidwell, knew nothing about DC, knew nothing about anything. I was just in a new place. Like I'd been all my life, every three years, I was in a new place. So um, when I arrived in sixth grade, I, um, the only other black person that I saw was Guilford Queen. And I, you know, I think he should be part of this panel. Um, his mother was a nurse and that, that was it. Um, and then a year later, my brother came, Ben Davis, and he's two years younger than me. So he's the class of 73. Um, my experience at Sidwell was good for the most part. I missed 1967 in terms of how the world changed in 1967. Um, I was in Switzerland by then. I was going to school in Switzerland. So um, the, the things that um, George just talked about, I experienced from Switzerland, but also zooming in uh, from on vacations. Like uh, when ML King was killed, I, I happened to be on vacation in New Jersey and was headed mm -hmm. to DC to visit my grandmother. And uh, couldn't come because DC had exploded. So that's my kind of experience of the things that happened post 67, or at least 67 to 70. Um, 
So my experience at Sidwell was I had a good one. Um, I didn't really know much about racial issues because it was not new to me to go to school with white kids. I've been going to school with white kids since, since I started going to school. I went to school at, in, in, uh, in Liberia. Uh, I went to school with diplomat kids from around the world and Liberians. And you know wherever I went, that was the, the makeup. So it was not news to me, so to speak. It was probably news to other people, but not me. Um, and I didn't, um, you know, I just interacted with, around the issue of whether I liked you, didn't like you. There were issues of the it girls and things like that. But um, other than that, I didn't feel any kind of shunning. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about my experience? Um, there was one issue which probably was a racial issue, but I didn't know that and my parents did not bring that up. They did not want us to, to, to think in those terms. My dad was born and raised in Atlanta, Jim Crow Atlanta. And um, his attitude was, I just want you to be the best you can be. And I want you to be able to mingle with anybody. <laughs> so, um, that, so race was not a framework for me at that stage. Um, and also I had grown up in Africa, I, you know, so I just had a lot of different experiences coming into Sidwell. Um, but there was a professor, not professor, a teacher, Captain somebody, I can't remember his, his name, but um, I was having issues with reading, um, a slow reader. And, um, and he was, uh, I think he was the teacher for science class, something like that. And I hated science, to be honest. So anyway, um, uh, so it, then there was a need to get a tutor for me for, for reading. And the, the teacher's answer was, well, she can just not take science and, you know, take more reading classes. And my dad was adamant. I just remember him being adamant about, no, she's going to take science and we will supplement the reading. Uh, issues through Georgetown. So that's the closest I can come to any kind of um, negative experience um, for me personally. I had friends, I went to, I went to their houses and played, so to speak, or, you know, I had, uh, I had to take a bus. We lived on Alaska Avenue at the time. I had to take a bus. The only other experience I, I had was, um, was not at school. It, I, I guess we, we integrated the neighborhood we were in. Um, but one morning my mother went out and you know how in DC the, the, the garage is empty onto what you call um, alleys, alleyways. Um, she went out and uh, started screaming and my brother and I ran to find out what the problem was. And there was KKK written on the, on across the garage door, but we had no, we, my brother and I had no relationship to KKK because we didn't grow up in that kind of environment. And we couldn't understand why she was having a problem with three letters, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously we found out what that was, but she didn't tell us then either. So um, in, in many ways we were, a bubble in many ways. Uh, I mean, we lived in a bubble, even though we didn't know we lived in a bubble. Um, and my experience with Sidwell in terms of shaping me, uh, I think the Quaker uh, philosophy shaped me, even though technically I'm Episcopalian um, and grew up in uh, Islamic countries. <laughs> so. I'm kind of a neutral on religion, but, and that's why I, I took to Quakerism because it seemed to respect all religions. I didn't have to side with one or the other. And I believe that it's focused on community, uh, you know, being a part of the community or doing things with the community. I think that influenced me um, and also the concept of peace. <laughs> I work with the United Nations. I work on all kinds of what I call alphabet soup issues. 
um, across the board, uh, dealing with people in extreme circumstances to heads of state. So I um, feel very comfortable um, uh, with the, the Quaker environment from that standpoint. I later did work for the American Friends Service Committee, which I thought was pretty interesting. <laughs> um, I was the uh, in Philly. I was the um, uh, well. They had a budget cut, and they cut. They put two positions that should never have been put together. They put them together. So one was the um, editor of the Quaker Service Bulletin, which was national, and the other was being the PR mm -hmm. person nationally. And after three months, I told them. I told them I had to leave. Uh, um, and they pressed, it so happened that three other people on women, black women on staff in different parts of the country also chose to leave at the same time. So it looked like we did a, a united effort, which we didn't know, none of us knew each other. And so they pressed us as to why we were leaving. And so finally I said, well, you know, in, a, in the very nicest way I could, but the bottom line was we're here we're here uh, trying to help oppress people around the world. And I feel oppressed sitting right here in terms of the money that's being paid and the working conditions. So um, I guess those are my two most direct Thank you. Um, experiences uh, with Quakerism or French friends. Uh, I did come back to the fold, so to speak, um, I don't know, in my 40s, I came back to the fold because I was starting to piece together my life where I'd lived in different places and the influences they had and reconnecting with the people I knew then. And so since I guess, I, I can't remember which uh, class reunion it was, maybe, it, I think it was maybe the 40th class. I can't remember which class reunion it was, but I came back and I've been active with my class ever since. Um, so that's my story. Certainly. Thank you for sharing. I, I, I like the idea of reflection. And I, I think to that end, I want to <clears throat> get to the question that I am most excited to ask. And I, I simply can't pass up this opportunity to ask each of you for advice. <laughs> so I'm going to start with Cheryl. And that's not me saying that Cheryl's advice is going to be better than anyone else's advice. But I want to start with Cheryl. Um, and <laughs> What advice do you have for, for me, first of all, uh, for everybody on this call, um, for alumni, for current students, um, especially about, you know, barriers that may be similar to those that you faced? Well, you know, my advice is actually going to be what I suggested were my learnings, which is I think you carry yourself knowing that you are well prepared, make sure that you are well prepared. Um, you know, know that you deserve to be there. You know, you have a right and a place to be in that environment. And, you know, I always assume that people are gonna welcome me warmly. I don't go in assuming, you know, back then we didn't talk about microaggressions and unbiased, you know, unconscious bias and all these kinds of important concepts that are around now. We may have felt those things, but we didn't have the, the language, but, I believe that sometimes it's just ignorance that causes some of these issues. And, you know, just, I try to genuinely think that people are in general going to be good and positive. Obviously there's some issues. So, you know, just realize you have everything it takes. You can do anything. Thank you. Uh, George Cohen, some advice. Never look down on another man unless you're bending over to help him up. And the reverse is never let anyone look down on you unless they're bending over to help you up. You're the best out there. Be the best you can be. Let nothing stop you, period. Jeff? I guess I would say, you know, one of the things as I've gotten older, one of the things I try to do is get people in med school, pretty good attitude. And so I guess the role of mentorship, 
you know, by that to say, again, what I found in working with African-American students is that they feel that, oh, you got the grades, you got the MCAT, so and so, you're good to go. But they don't understand the informal networks, you know. And so, again, is that they don't understand the major thing I help students with essays and interviews. And I've tried to be an insider as much as I could to learn the game of admissions. I've been doing it since 1981, right? And so every year I try to adopt a couple of students to try to get them into medical school to learn the things you can't learn in the classroom. I can't help them with organic. I can't help them with that. But in terms of knowing the game and our Afro-American students, they're so innocent, naive, they don't know the game, right? And, and so try, and I always tell Afro-American students, you need to grab every single opportunity you can get somebody who will help you, you know, right? And that's kind of my hobby besides doing what I do here. And that's about it, so. I appreciate that. I think we have a, a couple other good sessions coming up about just that topic. So I'd encourage everybody to take a look at Side Up if they haven't already. Uh, George Ferguson, how about you, advice? I guess my advice is to stay focused. In today's world, there are a lot of opportunities to be distracted. And what seem to be barriers now are all relative, but stay focused on the prize. Don't let that distract you so you don't stay focused on your goal. Um, whatever is happening to you as a barrier, it, it's not the first time it's happened in the world to anybody. It's happened to other people. So don't hesitate to go get advice from mentors or guidance counselors or other people. Um, also, um, intermingling with other groups. Um, it's very comfortable to be around people who are just like you, but it's um, very valuable to just intermingle, get to know other people from other cultures, other backgrounds, other geographic areas, because they all have different perspectives. And I've never failed. I've learned something from everybody I've ever met. So don't exclude yourself from opportunities to mingle and get to know other people. Dorothy? Uh, my philosophy is um, let race and gender be the only reasons why you are not, uh, you can't take an advantage of a situation. Um, I think that people should, and I also think you need to get out of your own way, a lot of, um, a lot of self-doubt, <laughs> and there's no need to have self-doubt, um, so don't limit yourself because of what you think might be the problem or the issue. Um, and also take the road less traveled, <laughs> break out, do something different. Um, there's no reason why you have to go the corporate route or the this route or the that route or no reason why you can't combine all of them and create a whole nother route. <laughs> um, so just stay open-minded, try to stay as open-minded as, as possible. And, and open to new opportunities. I like that, thank you. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Greg Jackson. I agree with everything that's been said, but I would particularly like to echo what Jeff said because um, I, I think medicine like laws is similar in that the mentorship is really, really important. And I think that um, too many of our um, young people, particularly African-American people, think that they should not or they're afraid to ask for help. And th that just should not be. I mean, we're here to help. Um, and a lot of time help is offered, but it's not taken advantage of. Or at the time that someone finally calls and says, can you help me with this? It's a little too late. And so I, I think it's just really, really important. Um, I, I've always grown up with the idea that uh, I needed to give back. And part of that was the experience of Sidwell actually, because I think we all came in understanding that um, it was important for us to succeed because we, we laid the groundwork for others and other people, the opportunity that we have would be, um, would be there or not there and, and in part depending on what we did. And so um, it was very important. And I had a lot of strong mentors that helped me along the way. And um, certainly being, being a mentor and giving back in that way is, is something that I, I, I just encourage people to take advantage of because um, if, you, if you ask for help, you'll find it, it'll be there for you. Thank you. I, I 
I'm happy to say that at the age of 33, I have learned how to ask for help. I didn't know that at 23, but I, I wish I talked to you then. Uh, <laughs> the I think we have uh, we do have some time for some questions. So speaking of help, uh, Don and Sarah, can you please help me out with some of those? We haven't received any of all, I, I will say we have one question that I'll share in a minute that might be more of a light aside, but we haven't received a lot of questions yet. So if you do have a question, you can drop it in the chat to Don or myself, or if you wanna kind of wave to us and let us know and, and share your question verbally, we can do it that way too. Um, Andrew, one question we had was, do we have any school photos on hand of our panelists, which, I, we did not prep anyone to bring school photos with them. So I believe the answer is no. Never mind, Cheryl is winning at show and tell today. I'm originally in marketing and you know, marketing people always have lots of show and tell. So this is the 1967 graduation photo of all of us which um, I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but that is it. And of course I have my 67 Phylos yearbook, which has all of our pictures in it. So I, uh, and, and the, another thing that I do think if people haven't seen it, this is the black student fund um, report from 1964 uh, to 84, which is really, and I hope it's in the library at, um, Sidwell, which really gives quite an insight into the history of um, the efforts to integrate some of the private schools. There was actually a, an article written in the Parade Magazine I'm trying to remember if it was the Washington Post or the Washington Star about black students at private schools. And Sidwell was prominently talked about that um, in that in, in that article. Um, Sarah, if you give me a call or send me an email, I, I think I actually still may have a copy of that article after 50 years. And um, I, I, I will certainly provide it to you. I, I just wanted to say that I, I missed all of your presentations because I locked myself out of the room <laughs> and I had to go get security to come. And I kept saying, I'm on a panel, I'm on a panel. <laughs> so I have no idea what you said, okay? And I'm glad it's recorded and I can't wait to watch the recording because <laughs> I really was looking forward to hearing all your stories. And there we are, so. <laughs> Um, can I say one thing to Jeffrey? Jeffrey, you talked in your opening about being written out of a history that you had seen. I hope, have you seen this book, The Long Conversation? Because yeah. this is the history yeah. from 1883 to 208 and 2008, and you are definitely in there. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear I'm in there. <laughs> uh, it's a great book. Yeah. Oh, okay. Isn't it a great book? Um, okay. It's really quite, quite detailed, but um, a, a salute to you. And also somebody mentioned Guilford Queen. I know he's on the call yes. somewhere. Yes. And I want to give a big shout out. Oh, there he is. Because there he is. I think you two, Jeffrey yeah. and Guilford, you really are the, you know, the real African-American first. <laughs> and really shout outs to you. I also want to shout out my sister Joanne is there. Um, some people know that five of us from the Dottie family all graduated from Sidwell and three nephews. So we have eight Sidwell graduates. Um, so I just wanted to shout out there. I just like to add a footnote too. We haven't mentioned um, during the early years when we started um, what else was going on in the world. And of course that was much the Vietnam War in the background. So any of the males in the class had in the back of their mind, if they failed, um, it's off to war. You had a student deferment, and as long as you stayed in school, you were good. But um, if you didn't, you were possibly off to Vietnam. 
So, you know, with all of the things going on, somebody mentioned the Martin Luther King, the riots in 68 and so forth, but at the same time, the Vietnam War was going on. So there was just a lot of turmoil and focusing during that time um, was very tough, I can say. I, I, I would like to ask if Guilford Queen can say something about his experience because he, he, he's like the backbone, <laughs> um, just his experience uh, being at Sidwell um, and his perspective. Did you hear me, Guilford? There. Takes a second to unmute. I, I think everyone's done a absolutely superb job in describing the different aspects of going to Sidwell, coming in from outside schools, and really making a, uh, a significant impact. Um, I started in kindergarten, went all the way through 12th grade and had some uh, wonderful experiences there. And um, many of the things that you all have said, I'd have to say it echoes that. There are other things that were involved, uh, but that would be for another time in a different kind of uh, forum. This one has been very right on. And I think, uh, I think you all have done a superb job. And still, it's hats off to you, Guilford, and to you, Jeffrey, because you really did. You were the pioneers. I think we did some pioneering, absolutely. But I think of you guys as the real pioneers. Yeah. Yeah. And your mom. <laughs> and your mom. Can't forget your mom. <laughs> yeah. We do I, have I will do one here. shout out for my mother. Um, you all should know that she kept everyone's confidence. And here was our, uh, our, our making sure that that happened. If all the blinds in the infirmary were closed, I was not to walk in and I was to wait outside on the other side of Zartman House for her to come out. If all the blinds were closed and the Statue of Liberty was on the outside of, uh, of the... Uh, Blinds for me to see, take the bus home. You know, you want to let everybody, I'm not sure children. everybody knows who your mom was and her critical role. Could you let everybody know? Oh, yeah. sure. She asked me when I was in the eighth grade if I minded if she took a job as the nurse. And I was like, okay, how are we going to work this out? Because uh, her special talent was knowing when someone was doing something wrong and being there. And I said, what, what do you want to do here, mom? <laughs> so uh, from uh, the end of eighth grade, she said, I won't come over to lower school. I mean, to middle school. And then in ninth grade, unless she got called to high school, she left high school for me to hang out in. So whatever I was doing, she wouldn't just walk in on. Uh, she was the nurse. She seemed to be everyone's confidant and um, was very respected in that role. And I made sure she stayed on her end of campus and I stayed on mine. That's a great truth. <laughs> oh, and, and it meant that instead of taking the bus like George did, I, I took the Northern route coming to Sidwell, the Ivy City bus going over to Friendship Heights and down. Um, wow, by 10th grade, I was getting a ride home like you know 80% of the time. Now that was great as opposed to the bus. Well, uh, you know, of course, I have the bus story as well, and I know you can't see this, but this is the transfer, the last transfer yeah. that yeah. I ever got yeah. from the day that I graduated. All you all nodding, you wow. know what a transfer yeah. is, yeah. but this is from June 7th, 1967, which I've kept. Last time, I took the bus over for graduation, and maybe I got a ride. Some of you know we used to ride with Lonnie, we all but you know you were gonna be late if you rode with Lonnie. So it was fun in his car when his dad got that Mustang. Remember when the dad got the Mustang and you could ride in the Mustang, but you would be late. Mm. Wonderful That's session. Cool. I think everyone did a wonderful job in describing uh, aspects of Sidwell. It's so nice to be with everyone. To that end, I think we do have a few questions uh, that I'd like to. We do have a couple of minutes um, that have been asked by the group. Uh, the first is just for, for anybody, anybody can chime in. Uh, do you think uh, going to Sidwell opened doors that you wouldn't have 
that wouldn't have otherwise been opened? Um, and if so, do you find that others tried to close those doors to you outside of Sidwell? Was Sidwell ahead of the curve, uh, ahead of its time when it came to integration? What would you say? I'm not sure that I can say, at, at least at the time, I knew at the time that Sidwell was ahead of the curve. I, I, I can say that I certainly felt um, a more welcoming atmosphere at Sidwell than when I visited um, some of the other schools like St. Albans, Georgetown Prep, uh, St. Stephen's, those, those kinds of environments. And so um, I felt more comfortable and confident at, at, at Sidwell. And um, I, I think that it did open s some doors because there was a recognition that um, there was, Sidwell was unique and the fact that I had the opportunity to go there um, in, in the minds of a lot of people made me, cause them to think about an opportunity for me and, and giving me an opportunity. So I think it helped. I, I just think it helped. And certainly all the things that I learned while I was there. Certainly, anyone else? I, I think it's helped in my adult life but, uh, beyond school. like. I tell people now, you know, I went to Sidwell and, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they pay attention. Right. But I wasn't, it, it was just another school to me. So I didn't really promote it. You know, I was like, okay, I went to Sidwell, you know, big deal. And then um, uh, I do remember, I think probably the other school my parents were looking at was National Cathedral. Uh, but I, I knew I didn't want to go there because they had uniforms. <laughs> was not doing that and it was all girls so I really wasn't doing that but in any case um I uh I I do I guess when Sidwell has come out for me to talk about it so to speak is is uh when um when the Obama children went I felt really and still feel really honored about the fact that um well, we collectively opened that door um, for them to eventually come. And it, it meant a lot to me that they started at the grades that I started. Um, it, it just, it was like full circles, like, oh, this is really cool. You know, this, this actually worked kind of thing. It, it's more of an afterthought than, than a conscious thought. Um, but I do say that um, also to help people outside to understand that they weren't the ones that did this. There's a whole lineage of us that did this. <laughs> um, and I'm real into explaining the histories of thing, various things um, with the Foreign Service. I'm in, I'm, I talk about African-American pioneer Foreign Service officers. It didn't just happen with Colin Powell, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it's helped. I mean, it's, it's a talking point, let's put it that way. I think also to, to put it in context at the same time, again, um, by the time we graduated in 1967, colleges, a lot of colleges were more actively recruiting African-American students. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to know the answer to that question because by the time we got there, we might've been recruited anyway, um, but certainly the preparation was there and we hit the ground running when the doors did open in the college and universities as well. I was talking to someone recently and the issue of crossover came up. And um, uh, I do believe, because in, I've been, and I'm just saying this, I've been in a number of situations where I'm the first at whatever. <laughs> and that could be gender or race or both. Um, and I've recognized that role. It's a kind of role you take where, uh, People accept you, the, uh, I'll call it the other side, accepts you uh, because they feel like they can deal with you somehow. Uh, you're not, quote, threatening. <laughs> and, then they, and then you walk through the door and you are who you are and you present who you are, which is all of you. And in that process, you are educating them about whatever and um, opening other doors. Um, and I feel like all of us really have played that role um, as we've gone into our respective careers or lives or whatever. Um, and I think it's, it's something that, that is 
difficult because you are about you are walking in two different worlds at the same time and um and and you're also as a kid you're 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 creating your own identity i mean who is who am i you know in the midst of all this um so i just bringing that out that um uh, people accepted us because of certain reasons and there are their reasons, not necessarily our reasons. Thank you. I, I, I think we have time for just one more question, but before I do, I, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you. A lot of the things I'm seeing in the chat aren't questions. They're just wow. And thank you. And, and transformative. And, and I, I agree fully. So thank you. Um, I think the last question, uh, uh, it's about experiences and some of these uh, might involve Lonnie's Mustang. Um, I don't know, uh, but your favorite experiences at Sidwell Friends. I think that's a good one to end on. Well, I'll start with one. I don't know about favorite, but you talk about being in two worlds and it's so true. And to this day, I know the music of Motown and the music of the monkeys. And I can sing these, as they say, really white, white British songs, which I never admit to anybody but you guys. I love them. But I also love the, um, the Motown review, of course. And um, I think that's just kind of a favorite memory, going to the Sadie Hawkins dance. Um, you know, like in trying to get some music that we could really dance to. The other thing is, you know, when I was admitted, my mom was excited, everything was great, but my mom did not want me dating any of the white guys there. So she made sure I knew where there were black guys at other schools that I could, as we say, import for the dances. And for the first two years, we, imported um, wonderful black men, young men for the dances. So that's just one thing. And then things change. So those are, I know, superficial in some respects and not deep, no. but those are No. I remember singing in the library and it was one of those monkey songs. <laughs> singing with my girlfriend, Ellen Wise from eighth grade. <laughs> And we, we, we just loved this song and we were just belting it out the loudest that we could ever belt out in the middle of the library. And we, you know, we got in trouble. <laughs> it was, we were just carried away. You remember <laughs> Herman's Hermits too? Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, you know, yeah. Or, you know, having crushes on the one or two of the boys in my class, but being shy because at eighth grade, you're, you know, you're not you're not that outgoing. And then I had a crush on Carl Rowan, who I didn't know he was in the, um, high school. I didn't know. I just, he didn't know who I was. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I was like, so yeah. Yeah. Very fun. I remember the night basketball games there <clears throat> at the time. Uh, the public schools was what I was really familiar with. And, and in fact, most of the public schools and even a lot of the Catholic schools at the time played their games right after school. And we played some games after school, but the, the night basketball games were, were special. And there was usually a, a dance or a party afterwards right at the school, at least it said well. But it was, it was something that I didn't expect to experience. I thought my experience in playing sports would be like there were in the other schools. And um, that was that was different. That was special. Um, something I, 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 I kind of didn't expect. And the camaraderie that existed among the few of us that were there was also very, very special. And um, I, I just remember the, the rides in Lonnie's car, the other things, the other times together, Going to the hot shops across oh, the street before before the hot games. Shop. That was that was our game time meal location. We would go over to the hot shops, and I was very superstitious, and so I would always have a teen twist, a coke, and French fries before a game. And and, and so uh, th those kinds of things, those kinds of memories are very fond, and they stand out. Yeah. 
What about the Zebra Club? I did not go down to the Zebra Club. <laughs> I, I remember the Zebra Club. And I remember everybody going down there. And but I just I knew didn't. that my going there would not be a good thing. And so I, I stayed away from the Zebra Club. I was not risking that scholarship. No, 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 no. No. My memory is sort of silly. I was recruited to help sell hot dogs um, during the home football games. So there were five of us who took the big boiling thing of hot dogs from the kitchen, Ms. Muffet, the dietitian made them. And there were sodas in bottles then that we sold. And of course, after the games, you'd have to go crawling under the bleachers to pick up all the bottles because back then there was a deposit on them. So in order to make a profit and turn it over to the school, we had to collect all the bottles. So we were there until an hour or two after the game picking up bottles. Ridiculous memory, I don't know, that sticks in my mind. <laughs> You know, one of the uh, things that helped me adjust socially at Sidwell happened when I was an 85 pound freshman. I was the lightest person in the school period. Way too small for football, about a foot and a half too short to compete with Greg in basketball. <laughs> and so Cliff Barber, big massive guy, came up to me one day at about three o'clock and says, Hey, man, you want to get a varsity letter? I said, me? No way I can get a varsity letter. He says, put this uniform on. And he threw a wrestling uniform. I said, be down at the mat, 3.30. So I went there, and it was a, a match against some other team. And I got the stuff and beat out of me in about 30 seconds. <laughs> but I was embraced warmly by the team, and I got to practice. And then you get to bond with people. You get to make friends it helped bring me out of my social shell. So that was a, a, a neat moment. But if it hadn't have been for uh, my being 85 pounds, I probably never would have started. I just wanna say thank you to all of you for being on this panel. And I know that we're, we've hit our closing mark here and we would just love to keep going on and on. And I know that there's time for lots of social um, opportunities over the next day or so. Um, Cheryl, I'll let you have the last word if you'd like um, before I, oh, I thought you were waiting to say <laughs> well, <I didn't> goodbye. <laughs> Never mind then. I just wanted to close actually by reading the thank yous we got in the chat for all of you. Um, and then we'll pop off and head off to the other sessions throughout the weekend. Uh, we got a note from a 77 alum who said, so wonderful to hear your stories and insight and wisdom. Thank you so much. A class of 17 alum said, thank you all so much. Class of 86, yes, I agree 100% with Rashida and Natasha. Thanks so much to the panelists and for these tremendous stories. Uh, Rashida said, uh, not a question, just wanna say thank you all for sharing your stories. You paved the way for the rest of us. Uh, Natasha said, uh, Cheryl, you're always prepared. <laughs> and a class of 06 alum said, thank you so much to these amazing panel members and thanks for hosting Andrew, this has been lovely. So I, I think those uh, Quakers speak my mind. Um, thank you all again for being here and taking time out of your lunch hours or wherever you are, what time it is for being with us. So thank you so much and we'll close things out. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.